good evening. We're glad you have gathered here. You doing all right, Miss Butch? You doing good? Well, I'm glad all of you are here this evening. Let's stand together as we worship this evening. It washes white as snow. Let's say that together again. Yes, hold the blood of Jesus. Hold the blood of Jesus. Hold the blood of Jesus. It washes white as Snow. It washes white as snow. It washes white as snow. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. In the precious blood of the Lamb. And all God's people said, and now you can take a breath. Y'all was trying to follow along. That song moves along pretty quick. But you know, there's nothing better than singing about the blood and what it means to each one of us. And I'm so grateful that because of the shed blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that I can stand here forgiven. And I know that I'm, our Lord loves me, and I know that He loves you, and I know that it is just a joy to think about what all He means to each one of us. So let's have a word of prayer as we begin tonight. The Lord, we do thank You. We thank You for just the eternal life, Lord. Lord, just the amazing grace that you show to each one of us. Lord, we know that in that word grace, Lord, is the hope for us to have eternal life, to have everlasting life, and just the promise of a better tomorrow. And so, Lord, I pray tonight that you will just uh, restore the joy in our hearts, Lord, that as we go through our difficult struggles in life, that we know that you're still on the throne, that you're an omniscient God, Lord, you know our needs, Lord, and you lead God and direct us according to your will for our lives. And Lord, we love you. And again, we pray that you would just be here, Dr. Ken, tonight. Lord, just anoint him with the Holy Spirit and just help us to receive a word tonight that you have for us. And it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. It's good to see you all here this evening. Thank you, Brother Kevin. I call what we just sang aerobic praise, all right? Man, my heart is beating faster and I needed that. And so... Thank you so much uh, for that. Now, I know there's a, a special call business meeting after our time of Bible study tonight, and so 
I'm going to try my best to, to be a little shorter in what I share tonight, but there are no promises. You know, every, I think every preacher thinks every message ought to reach out and touch eternity a, a little bit. I heard about a pastor that was droning on and on and on, and an old boy got up and started to walk out in just kind of a small country church, and the preacher said, hey, Brother Smith, said, where are you going? He said, well, I'm going to get a haircut. He said, well, why didn't you take care of that before you came to church? He said, I didn't need one before I got here today. So uh, that's a long-winded preacher, but I'll try not to be that long-winded. If you've got your copy of God's Word, I'm going to invite your attention to Psalm 38 tonight. Psalm 38. By the way, on the front pew are some little listening sheets, I call them, with some fill-in-the-blanks uh, outlines. If you want to run down and pick one up and you've not done so already, and I'll try to give you these points as we go and they should be on the screen as well I want to talk to us tonight around this theme finding relief from our regrets now there are two types of basic messages one is what is called an expository message or an expository sermon or an exposition of scripture I will tell you that is my favorite way to preach just take a text and go all the way through the text, deriving the points from the text itself. But ever so often, I will bring what's called a topical message, and that is where we deal with the topic, and we deal with a number of different scriptures that speak to that topic. And so we're, we're in that vein tonight, and so we're not going to do an expositional study of Psalm 38, but I want to use it as a backdrop to the message. These are the words of David. We're all familiar with the story of David, the highs as well as the low. Of course, the great low of his life, his sin with Bathsheba, and of course covering it up and having her husband sent to the front of the battle and killed. And so I believe it's in the aftermath of that that David writes words like these. We're talking about our regrets. That almost seems too light a word for that which David expresses it. Just follow along here, Psalm 38. We'll read just the first eight verses together. O oh Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. For your arrows have sunk into me, and your hand has come down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no help in my bones because of my sin for I, my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden they are too heavy for me my wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness I am utterly bowed down and prostrate all the day I go about mourning for my sides are filled with burning and there is no soundness in my flesh I am feeble and crushed. I groan because of the tumult of my heart. Have you ever felt something like that? That crushing weight of guilt? Have you ever felt like you were just adrift in a sea of shame? That you were drowning in an ocean of guilt I was doing some reading earlier today and I was examining a passage I'd run across from Alfred Lord Tennyson if you know anything about British literature I mean I was an English major in college so I done learned me how to talk goodly so uh, but Alfred Lord Tennyson was the poet laureate in Great Britain for most of the reign of Queen Victoria and he writes in this poem called Guinevere in his work, The Idols of the King. It's about Guinevere and King Arthur. And, of course, Guinevere, in this one passage, is, is grieving over the remorse that she has because of her own infidelity toward King Arthur. And, and she writes this in, in Tennyson's words, Shall I kill myself? What help in that? I cannot kill my sin if soul be soul, nor can I kill my shame, nor... By living, can I live it down? The days will 
grow to weeks, the weeks to months. The months will add themselves and make the years. The years will roll into the centuries, and mine shall ever be a name of scorn. Sounds a lot like David to me. Words of remorse and words of regret. If you're following along on your listening guide, just note this introductory statement there. Few things in life hurt like a guilty conscience. Few things in life hurt that bad. Now, guilt dogs the footsteps of all mankind. Why? Because we're all sinners. You see, there's the fact of guilt, and then there's the feeling of guilt, and it is that feeling of guilt that I want us to deal with tonight. Unless someone has departed from reality totally, guilt is going to be with that person. It's going to gnaw at that person's heart. It's going to haunt that person and, and hunt that person. Ogden Nash, that writer and humorist, once wrote, there's only one way to achieve happiness on this terrestrial ball, and that is to have either a clear conscience or none at all. But the truth is, we all have a conscience. It's like an internalized parent in our lives. And that is a good gift from God. And here's what I've discovered about the conscience unless it is a seared conscience, we never seem to be able to turn it off. And that's a good thing, but it can lead to a bad thing. It can lead to this constant feeling of overwhelming shame, remorse, regret, and of course, guilt. It's that feeling of guilt. Dr. Paul Tournier, the Swiss counselor, a brilliant man, said this, there's no worse suffering than a guilty conscience and certainly none more harmful. But I want you to just note this second introductory statement. The conjoined twins of misery are resentment and regret. Resentment. We talked about that Sunday, if you were here, as we talked about dealing with bitterness. And you see, resentment is when we do not forgive others. Regret is when we do not receive forgiveness for ourselves. But every one of us has to deal with guilt and remorse and deep Regrets why? Because of course everybody sins. I may be talking to somebody in this worship center tonight or somebody watching this Bible study on YouTube and maybe you're asking yourself something like this now or you have in the past. If only I had listened. Or this, I can't believe I did that. Or maybe you said something like this, how could I have been so foolish? And you're dealing with what? Regrets. There are two Christian educators, Dr. Lord Perry and Dr. Charles Sell. They wrote a great book called Speaking to Life's Problems. And in that book, they had a couple of chapters on guilt. And one quote I want to just pull out for you. For some, they said, such an insightful quote, for some, the present is difficult. For others, it is the dread of the future that is difficult. Now watch this. The worst foe of the soul, however, is the past because it contains the power to make the present dreadful. While anxiety is dread of the future, guilt is dread of the past. Wow. And what a deep-seated strongly rooted emotion guilt is it can lead to such unease such discomfort such anxiety such restlessness and such deep sorrow friends guilt is a very powerful emotion that can turn people into a bundle of nerves and send them to the hospital where they'll be looking for a 
diagnosis over their physical complaints. Our deep regrets can awaken us in the middle of the night and fill us with dread of what the morning is going to hold if we don't learn how to deal with a guilty conscience. So how do we, how do we find relief from our regrets? Two main truths tonight. First is this. I want you to note how we may respond to our regrets. And by the way, these responses I'm going to share with you are all wrong. There's some ordinary responses to our guilt, thinking somehow that we are going to fix this problem, but none of these work. Let me just give you three uh, different types of responses. Item A, we bury them. We seek to bury our regrets. We will conceal them. We will ignore them, or we'll try to. We'll deny them, we'll disguise them, we'll disregard them. Some try to bury their regrets with booze, or pills, or illicit experiences. Listen, all that does is lead to what? More guilt. And folks, if we just try to deny our guilt, we're actually lying in three directions. If you go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. And so we are lying to other people. Two verses later we read, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So we lie to other people, we lie to ourselves. Two verses later, 1 John 1, 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a lie. Friend, if you deny your sin, you're lying in three directions, to others, to yourself, and to God. There's an old saying, I don't know who to attribute it to, but I think it's very poignant, to err is human, and to cover it up is too. And we uh, understand that truth, Psalm 32 verse 3 David said when I kept silent my bones wasted away through all my groaning all day long he said for your hand was heavy upon me and it sapped my strength J just as in the heat of summer boy we know about our strength being sapped in the middle of summer right and David said because the hand of the Lord is on me and my guilt is, is so ever present with me my very strength is just being sapped. You know what's the problem with trying to bury our regrets? They're just like the bad guy in the movie or the monster in the horror flick. They always rise again. They always come back from the dead. But let me give you three ways we try to bury them. Three quick words here. Number one, we minimize. We minimize. We say about our sin, no big deal. Hey, I'm only human. Nobody's perfect. And we all have weaknesses. Why all the fuss? Or in a similar vein, item two, we rationalize. Well, lots of people do it. I didn't hurt anybody. Well, you don't know my circumstances, what was going on in my life at the time. Or probably the worst rationalization of all. Well, I can always get forgiveness later. Friends, don't presume on the grace of God like that. And then the third word, we compromise. If we're not careful, we'll just lower our standards. If we feel guilty because we're not reaching a certain standard, we may just lower our standards. So we can say, well, nothing's really wrong with it. That's what the Bible mentions as calling evil good. And that's when our souls get jaded and we have what the Bible calls a seared conscience. Our hearts can become hard. The old Chinese proverb had it exactly right, commit a sin twice and it will not seem a sin. How true. Proverbs 28, 13, whoever conceals transgressions will not prosper. And so burying them doesn't work. Here's another thing we do, another response. Item B, we blame others. We blame others. A well-known tactic. Friend, do you understand blaming others is as old as mankind? 
We've been blaming others since the Garden of Eden. Right? When Adam was convicted over his sin of eating that forbidden, forbidden fruit, he took it like a man. He blamed his wife. Right? And in effect, he blamed God because he said, watch this, the woman that you gave me, <laughs> she's the one that caused me to sin. And then the woman did what? She blamed the serpent, right? You know, the devil made me do it. didn't start with Flip Wilson. Some of y'all are old enough to understand that, right? The devil made me buy that dress. You, you, you watch the old Flip Wilson show. So Adam blamed the woman. The woman blamed the snake, and the snake didn't have a leg to stand on. <laughs> You'll get that one about midnight tonight. So blaming others. Listen, somebody said to blame is to be lame. You see, folks, here's the way blame works. It's almost like we've got a scale, and on one side of the scale is our guilt. And when it starts getting a little too heavy on us, what we want to do is get some of that guilt off of us and put it on to others through blame so we can kind of what? Alleviate some of that guilt off of ourselves. That is certainly not the biblical approach. To have blame and guilt as two sides of the scale. Lifting ourselves up by pushing others down. By the way, have you ever known how negative and critical guilt-ridden people can be? Finding faults in others. Why? Because they're so guilty with their own faults. So we may try to bury them. We may try to blame others. And here's a third response. We berate ourselves. That's Psalm 38. That's what David is doing. We can't turn it loose, so we just beat ourselves up. We, we just live in self-condemnation. We, we remain prisoners in, inside a jail of the past. There are different types of self-punishment. We can deny ourselves happiness. I don't deserve that. We can deny ourselves success. I don't deserve that. Self-punishment can lead to insomnia or ulcers or heart attacks or high blood pressure or strokes. And, of course, the worst result of that berating of ourselves, suicide. How many people have taken the precious gift of life that God gave them at their own hands because they didn't know how to deal with a guilty conscience? Our problem is that conscience just doesn't know how to quit. But I'm glad that we don't have to quit the Bible study right now because that's all bad news. I want you to look at item two. I want you to note how we may release our regrets. We've looked at how we may respond to our regrets in terrible ways. But how do we release our regrets? Can I tell you in one word, it's the same answer that we gave on Sunday when we were dealing with bitterness, harboring a grudge, holding a resentment, we said the way to overcome bitterness is through forgiveness. And the main word we used in forgiving others, release. Release where we let the other person go. The other person doesn't owe us anything. We're going to absorb the wrong. We absorb the injustice, if you will. And we let the other person go free. Friend, it's the same thing when we receive the forgiveness of God. It's that same sense of relief and release that comes when we're pardoned by the Lord. Psalm 25, verse 11, David prayed so simply, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. So it's through pardon. It's through being recipients of the forgiveness of God. And I think the Bible makes it clear how this process works. So let's break it down. First, item A. First, there will be conviction. Conviction. Thank God that His Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and convicts us of our guilt. This is where guilt can be a good thing, right? If our conscience is awakened and we feel guilty because we are guilty. But I lean into this. I want you to understand, a lot of people don't really get the difference between the Holy Spirit's conviction and Satan's accusation. Right? Revelation 12, 11 says he's the accuser of the brethren. 
the devil is, that old serpent. He accuses us day and night. And here's the difference. When the Holy Spirit of God convicts, he does so legitimately. The Holy Spirit puts his finger on our sin. He's right, and we know he's right. When the devil accuses, he does so illegitimately. It may be that we're feeling guilty over a sin that we've already dealt with. It may be a false sense of guilt that's unrealistic, or, or we're not meeting some unrealistic expectations from others or from ourselves. But again, God's conviction through the Holy Spirit, legitimate. Satan's accusation illegitimate watch this the Holy Spirit's conviction is specific you lied you lusted you acted ugly you lost your temper I mean he puts his finger on a sin specifically oftentimes the accuser brings this kind of sense of uneasiness it's just kind of a general feeling that something is not right and then the most important thing when God convicts us, He does so redemptively to draw us closer to Himself. When Satan accuses us, He does so punitively to try to push us further away in our fellowship with the Lord. So let's note the difference between the devil's accusation and the Holy Spirit's conviction. By the way, Jesus said in John 8:44 that the devil is a liar. And he is the father of lies. The truth is not in him. You know, when the devil speaks, he speaks his natural language. Jesus said, it's, it's lying. He, he, listen, the devil lies to us twice about sin. This is worth coming to Wednesday night to get what I'm about to give you right here. Ready? Here's the first lie of the devil. Oh, it's not so bad. Everybody does it, or nobody's going to find out. Go ahead, man. Go ahead. It's not so bad. And so we take the bait and we sin, and then here comes a second lie. Oh, it's so bad. What you've done, oh, I can't believe you did that, and God will never, ever forgive you of that. He's, he's lying. Both times, the devil is a liar. The Holy Spirit's a convictor. Satan is an accuser. There'll be no peace until we recognize the difference. We'll not have this relief from our regrets. So first, there will be conviction. Here, item B. Second, there must be confession. Confession. Let me give you a few verses. Psalm 38, 18. David writes, after all this heaviness, he writes that we just read out of Psalm 38. He dropped to verse 18, and he finally says this, I confess my iniquity, I am sorry for my sin. In Psalm 32, 5, another psalm where David's dealing with the sin of his having committed adultery and murder and, and having concealed it all. I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And of course, we're all familiar with 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He, God, is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Now, I want to just dive quickly into that word confess. And I, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that several of you were hoping when you came to church tonight that I would share a Greek word with you. Is that what you wanted, right? I figure so. So I aim to please, all right? So th this is one of those beautiful Greek words that's made up of two words, the word confess. In the Greek, it's the word homo logeo. Now, that prefix homo means same in the Greek, right? For example, if there's same-sex attraction or involvement, we call that homosexuality. If you're talking about a, a people group where all the people are the same, it is a homogeneous unit. Milk that's been, you know, purified, it's homogenized milk. And you can even see that word homo in there. So homo means same. Logeo means to speak. 
It's the verb form of the noun logos. In the beginning, John 1, 1, in the beginning was the what? Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the word for word is logos. And so logeo means to speak a word or to say. So you've got saying and say. And so you put it together. When we confess our sins, this is good. It means we say the same thing about our sin that God says. God says, that's a sin. God, I say the same thing. It's a sin. God said, that is wrong. God, I agree. I say the same thing. It is wrong. God says, you need to repent of it. Oh, God, I do. I say the same thing. I, I repent of it. You stand in judgment against that sin the same way that God does. You're saying the same thing. God says, you need to quit it. God, I say the same thing. I need to turn from it. I need to quit it. Folks, when we agree with God about what he says in his word about our sins, that is confession. And folks, what far too many of us try to do when we feel guilty is, is we want to play a game with God called let's make a deal. Lord, if you'll just forgive me, then I will what? Work, tithe, you know, pray more, read your Bible more, serve more. No, no. God doesn't want your deal. God wants your honesty. God wants you to say the same thing about your sin that he says about your sin. Quit trying to bargain with God. We're not talking about a bargain. We're talking about a gift. When I was in seminary, this was a long time ago, one day a professor, there was an old man he brought into class that day, and he said, this is Dr. Paul Bilheimer. I mean, my jaw dropped. I'd read a couple of books by Dr. Paul Bilheimer. It, it, his works had meant so much to me. And I'll never forget something he said that day in that seminary class. He said, fellas, if you want to touch God at his soft spot, touch him at the point of mercy. Is that not a good word? He said, God loves to show himself merciful to people who've run out of bargaining power. Oh, I love the old hymn that says, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. You know that great invitation hymn, Just As I Am? I love that. I love that song. I love the line that says, Just as I am, without one what? Plea. I don't have a plea bargain to make with God. I don't have an argument to present to Him. I am bankrupt. I mean, even the Beatitudes start off with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Poor in spirit. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And so we're not talking about bargaining with God. We're talking about confession. It's either going to be confession or condemnation. But note item C. Only then can there be confidence. 1 John 3, 2, 21, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. 1 John chapter 2, those first two verses, John says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you that you do not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Here's another Greek word, two for one tonight. The word for advocate Parakletos. You know, in Great Britain, they still call their attorneys paracletes. Para, alongside of, right? Like parallel lines. Kletos, call. And so our advocate is one who is called to be alongside of us. Friend, I'm so glad that I've got an advocate, the Lord Jesus, that has been called to stand alongside of me before the judge. Years ago, I heard a fellow say, I think it's good theology. He said, Jesus is my lawyer, and he's just like Perry Mason. He ain't never lost a case. And then he said, because the judge is his daddy. That was some good theology, right? 
Thank God for the advocate that we have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, two things we can be confident of, and I'm going to take this home, take it to the house and go to the house. Item one, we can be confident that we have forgiveness. Several precious verses. Just, just listen. Let it speak to your heart. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions. By the way, I'm glad he said as far as the east is from the west. You know, when that fifth grade teacher held that globe up in your class, you can only go north so far, and then you'll be going south again. But friend, if you start going east, you'll always go east. If you start going west, you'll always go west. I'm glad he didn't say as far as the north is from the south. Because up there at the North Pole, they're very close to one another, right? But as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgressions. Uh, Isaiah 38, 17, for you have cast our sins behind your back. How big is the back of God? God speaking in Jeremiah 31, 34, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. So friends, you, you've dealt with sin, you've confessed it with the Lord, and then a few days later the devil's whispering in your ear about it, and you go to the Lord and you say, oh God, I just want to talk to you about this sin again, and God's going to say, what sin are you talking about? He forgives and he forgets. And then one last verse, Micah 7, 18 and 19. You will cast all of our sins into the depth of the sea. And I like what the country preacher said. And God not only casts our sins in the depths of the sea, he puts up a no fishing sign. Amen. Last thing, we can be confident not only that we have forgiveness, but we have a future. Amen. A future. Isaiah 43, verses 18 and 19, just one part of that. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I am doing a new thing, God. It's springing up. Do you not perceive it? He's always doing a new thing. That's why Paul could say in Philippians 3, 13, and 14 that he was forgetting those things which lay behind him and he was pressing on toward the goal. Some of us need to have some blessed amnesia to forget the former things and press on. Thank God that he is the God of the second chance and the third and the fourth and the fifth, right on down the line. Let me close with this story. Some of you may remember this. It's a famous sports story. It's about an incident that happened on January the 1st, 1929. Georgia Tech was playing the University of California in the Rose Bowl. About the middle of the second quarter, there was a great player. He played both ways for the University of California, Roy Regal. And he, a, a running back for Georgia Tech, fumbled the ball. And Roy Regals scooped it up. And he was only about 30 yards from his own goal line. But somehow he got spun around and he started running the wrong way. And he ran for almost 70 yards the wrong way. His quarterback was playing defense as well. They played both ways back then. And he's running down the field screaming at Roy to stop, stop. And finally he got a hold of him at the three-yard line and spun him around. But by that time, the Georgia Tech guys were down there and they tackled him on the one-yard line. Well, the, the Bears, the University of California Bears decided to punt rather than risk running a play right there on their goal line. And the punt was blocked for a safety. And they went into halftime, and Roy Regals was just sobbing over that mistake that he had made. Some people called it the greatest sports blunder ever. He was just inconsolable. And his coach said, as halftime ended, men, the same team who started this first half, we're going to start the second half. And Roy Regal said, Coach, I can't do it. I've ruined you. I've ruined myself. I've ruined the University of California. I couldn't face that crowd to save my life. And then I love what Coach Nibs Price said. Roy, get up and go back out there. The game is only half over. 
Roy Regals went out and he played the greatest half of his life. Now, sin has consequences. They actually lost the game 8-7. to seven. That safety was the difference. And Georgia Tech won the national championship. But Roy Regal's story has been used by motivational speakers and preachers like this one to remind people that the game is half over. God promises you a future, forgiveness and a future. And I'm going to leave you with this one last statement if you're following along. Praise God that failure never has to be final. Amen? Amen? Would you pray with me? Lord, we're grateful for the wonderful promises of your 